Well, thank you very much. And uh, may I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land uh, on which we meet this morning. Uh, and good morning. Oh, now Sue told me there was a lot of people here. <laughs> so let me try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Excellent. Now, I have to admit that I have one behavioural fault. Well, it's the one, um, it's the one behavioural fault that I'm prepared to admit, and that is that um, if you put your hand up to ask me a question, uh, I'll completely ignore you. So um, you have to break all those rules uh, that uh, you've been taught so well in school and that many of you have uh, taught over and over again and just use your voices. And we will have some opportunities for questions and conversations a little bit later on. <clears throat> so, picture this scene. Our hero is at a British, British railway station waiting for a train. Now, he's got some time to wait, so he buys himself a newspaper, a takeaway cup of coffee and a small packet of biscuits. The waiting area is fairly full, so he smiles at a businessman sitting uh, on his own at a table for four people. He receives a smile in response and a nod at the empty chair across the table, so he sits down. He places his coffee and his biscuits uh, on the table and spreads out his newspaper. He takes a sip from the coffee and starts to read. A few newspaper articles later, he notices his table companion, with whom he's not exchanged a word, reach out, tear open a packet and take out a biscuit. Now, he's somewhat shocked, but this is a British railway station, so he doesn't actually say anything. He wonders whether he should comment and what he should say. In the end, he just reaches out and takes a biscuit himself. Soon afterwards, the businessman reaches out and takes a second biscuit. And our hero matches his action, and still nothing is said. This goes on until the eight biscuits in the packet are gone. The businessman then gets up, nods and smiles at our hero, and walks off, presumably to catch his train. Our hero further ponders the businessman's conduct while he waits for his own train. And he finds it difficult, really, to concentrate on his newspaper. As the time for his train approaches, he stands up to go to the platform. He picks up his empty coffee cup, folds his newspaper, and discovers his own packet of biscuits underneath it. Now, this is a Douglas Adams story, comically highlighting how we make assumptions and how our brain and our actions can cause us to just reinforce those assumptions, rather than questioning and testing them. This story is funny, right? Someone takes someone else's biscuits, unknowingly or not. But the assumptions which are made about people with disabilities are not funny. They're often negative, usually negative, and they're usually wrong. And they're made about us every day of our lives. We are limited by the soft bigotry of low expectations. Education is no different. In education, as in other areas across the um, the community, people with disabilities are limited by the soft bigotry of low expectations. And when that bar is set low, most of us don't rise above that bar. So thanks very much for the opportunity to start off your conference today. I'm very pleased and a little bit nervous to be speaking to a room full of educators when I'm neither an educationalist or an academic. What I am is a lawyer, a human rights lawyer. So of course, having regaled you <coughs> with my biscuit story, I want to start with my caveats because that's what lawyers do. I've been asked to present at this conference, but you know far more about education than I do. I just experienced it far longer ago than I care to think about, as my hair colour would tell you. And interestingly, I experienced both segregated and inclusive education. So I'll talk from a personal and a broader disability perspective rather than from an educationalist perspective. 
And my plan is to give you that disability perspective so that you can overlay this day of discussions around turning into uh, knowledge into action with that perspective. If you like, it's the biscuit to eat with your tea or coffee. And that virtual biscuit will be one thing that I've given you today. The other is my web address, www.grahaminnes.com. And uh, that's also my address on Facebook and Twitter. And uh, you can uh, find out more about me there. Uh, I have already tweeted about the conference. You can tweet about it. Um, if you like what I've got to say, please tell me on Twitter and Facebook. If you disagree with what I've got to say, uh, then my name's Sue O'Reilly, OK? So. <laughs> We all know that education is powerful, transformative and must be available to everyone. It would be hard, particularly in this room, to argue with this sentiment, wouldn't it? Some, such as Peter Singer, might. He places a value on people's lives and values people with disabilities less than those of us without. He argues that parents with spina bifida, for example, um, should be able to painlessly end their children's lives at birth because he thinks that they're not quality lives and they're never going to be quality lives, so why should we let them occur? And in statements such as that, he dismisses the significant posi positive contributions which many children and adults with spina bifida make in the Australian community. Some of them are friends of yours. Some of them are friends of mine. Yet last year, when Peter Singer was on Q&A to espouse those and other views, was there a person with disabilities on the panel to challenge their views? No, there wasn't. See what I mean about limiting our opportunities and limiting our expectations? Now, at this extreme negative end of the spectrum, we also hear about kids being put in cages in classrooms a recent ACT example, only a couple of years ago, and p kids being dragged across the floors of a school by their feet, a recent Western Australian example. Now, I accept absolutely that these are extreme and that they would not be condoned by the vast majority of you here and by the, um, the school system here in Victoria, but they occur too frequently to just be one-off cases it's too easy for the extreme to become the norm if we only let the Peter Singer views of the world be the ones that are heard. I also recognise that educationalists are challenged by limited support and few resources. And I saw this when we did the PSD review. But such instances and such diminishing still shouldn't occur. And my question is, how might we change that resource challenge? What might we do about that? Well, here's a few suggestions that I would make. Firstly, we could stop spending between a third and a quarter of the budget for kids with disabilities in Victoria on assessments and get that money back into the classroom to train and support teachers and to educate kids. Assessments could be carried out by educators and focus on per positive learning experiences rather than putting families through the hor horrific experience of telling assessors how disabled their child is so that they can get the best level of funding. What an ironic contradiction that is to do. And I know how that reinforces the limiting and negative assumptions that I've talked about and reinforces those limiting and negative views by families about their kids. We could perhaps make specialist schools what their name implies, centres of excellence, tasked with sharing their resources with mainstream settings to achieve more inclusion, rather than places where kids are segregated. Now, I assume that when all of you signed up for a career in education, you signed up to educate everyone. That's true, isn't it? 
you signed up to educate everyone. And everyone includes the 12% of children and young Australians with disabilities. But currently, only 25% of us achieve HSC or higher qualifications when 50% of the general population achieve that level. We are employed at a rate 30% below that of the general population. And 45% of us live in or near poverty. So something's going wrong, something that we need to fix. Now, I want to ask you a question, but I need to remind you of that one behavioural fault that I talked about at the beginning of my presentation, which is, you know, that if you put up your hand, I'll completely ignore you. So answer with your voices. Who knows in broad terms the content of the Disability Discrimination Act education standards? Well, that response is educative in itself. Let me tell you a little bit about them because it's really useful for you to have this information. The Disability Discrimination Act gives the um, federal government the power to make what are called disability standards or regulations in particular areas of life, such as education, transport and access to, pre access to premises. It's why our transport system is getting more and more accessible. You know, there are more trams, trains and buses on which people with disabilities can travel. There's more announcements on those trains and trams and buses. It's why our buildings are getting more accessible. We're not there yet, we're not perfect, but we're seeing a lot more ramps, a lot better signage, um, more uh, elevators and more options for uh, paths of travel which allow people with disabilities to move through buildings with safety and dignity. And education standards detail what rights are protected by the DDA in the area of education. And they also inform education uh, organisations such as schools about the D their DDA obligations to assist people with disabilities. The aim of the standards is to give students with disabilities the right to participate in education on the same basis as students without disability. A person with disability should have access to the same opportunities and choices as those available to a person without disability. Sometimes to achieve this aim, an education provider must make adjustments to allow people with disability to take part in education. For example, a hearing loop installed in a university lecture hall. However, these adjustments must be reasonable and not cause what's called unjustifiable hardship. Now that's not just hardship, it's a higher barrier than that. So these adjustments must be made unless an organisation would experience unjustifiable hardship. But the thing to remember here is that mainstream schools are required to make these adjustments for their students with disabilities. And there's an expectation that that's what will occur, so that all students can be fully included, not just in classrooms, but throughout school life. A person with disability can make a complaint to the Australian Human Rights Commission if an education provider doesn't carry out its obligations under the standards. Here are 10 important points about the standards that I, I want to give you. One, and, and these are all available on the Human Rights Commission uh, website, so don't try and frantically write them down because I probably speak far too fast for that. One, students with disability should be able to enrol in a course or school just like anyone else. They need to be able to access all course or uh, an enrolment information. Two, information can be provided in different formats to meet a student's needs, large print, braille, electronic and audio recordings. And this should be provided reasonably quickly after the request is made for that material. Three, when planning an educational course and how to teach it, Education providers, which include schools, should consult with students with disability doing the course and consider their needs. And of course that means, in the case of children, particularly younger children, the families of students with disabilities. Four, 
Education providers should be flexible in the way that they teach a course and how people doing the course um, are, are assessed. Teaching should maximise the participation of students with disability. For example, if the course includes an activity that a student uh, cannot do because of their disability, a different activity that teaches the same knowledge or skills should be offered. <clears throat> it's not best practice to, um, to Velcro a teacher's aid to a student with disabilities and assume job done. An inclusive approach would be to teach the whole class and use the teacher's aid as a support across the whole class, thus including the student with disabilities. Five, a, a, an um, agreement about how a student will access their education should be in writing, such as an individual education plan. They are agreements negotiated with the family and as the child gets older, with the child. They're not plans which schools deliver to the family to tell the family how their child is going to be educated. They're a negotiated agreement. Six, support services should be offered to the students with a disability um, to complete the course. And they may include note takers, interpreters, or um, teacher's aides. As I said, supporting a whole classroom so that that teacher can um, devote more time to the student with a disability or, um, <clears throat> or, or providing support through other means such as note taking or interpreting. Seven, education providers should train staff to be aware of what support a student with disability needs and what adjustments may need to be made. So this information as the student progresses through school should be passed on from teacher to teacher or included on a student file so that teachers don't land in a class not even knowing that that class contains a student with a disability. This training should respect the dignity and privacy of the student. Staff should be aware of support services for the student uh, and what they involve. Eight, different ways of testing and assessing will sometimes need to be used for students with disabilities. So that long as these adjustments don't um, damage the uh, integrity um, and academic standards or essential requirements of a course. For example, where a student with disability may not be able to make a class presentation because of an anxiety disability, they can present in writing for their teacher to assess. The important thing is that the learning of that student is assessed, not the way the presentation is made. Nine, an education uh, provider must have clear rules about preventing harassment and victimisation from happening, not just in the classroom, but in the playground and in other parts of the school community and activities. All staff and students should be trained about these rules and the rules should always be followed. And 10, students with disabilities should have somewhere to go if they feel that they've been harassed or victimised. Complaints should be taken seriously and properly investigated. Complaints should be handled so that the dignity and privacy of the student and their family is respected. Now these are standards or regulations under the Disability Discrimination Act. So they are federal law and they apply across all Victorian schools, public or private. So <clears throat> if any or all of these standards are not being followed, then students or families of students are certainly entitled to raise with their school, with the school leaders, or with the um, department, the fact that those standards aren't being followed. I'm sure that most of you are well aware of these points, but perhaps not so aware that they're included in the, in the standards. And as I said, they're readily available on the Human Rights Commission website if you want to refresh them. But before we talk about what you should be doing, going above and beyond in terms of education, uh, in terms of providing a high quality education to all, it's valuable to know where the baseline is drawn. And so that's why I wanted to take you through those standards. Attitude and the way that we um, deliver education are driven by perceptions. And as I said earlier, if we set the bar low for people with a disability, um, most of them will not achieve above that bar. Most families 
will not encourage them to achieve above that bar because they won't understand that something different is possible. So if people with disabilities are to be fully included and receive an equivalent education to those without disabilities, we need to change attitudes. Now I want to challenge some existing mindsets and explore what a difference changing attitudes can make. And I do so with the insights gained as a person with a disability, because a different approach can often achieve a different result. And a different approach can also impact on quality teaching and learning experiences, enhance capabilities and support collaborative and purposeful relationships within schools. Further, it can change the negative attitude of other students and their families towards kids with disabilities. One of the major changes in the education system in the past few years is the move towards the nationally consistent collection of data. Previously, every jurisdiction has counted differently. And that's a real problem um, because um, we don't have consistent knowledge across the board as to students with disabilities and their participation. And the public school system claims, probably correctly, that it does the heavy lifting um, with regard to students with disabilities. So <clears throat> one of the things that um, this review did was sought to understand where kids with disabilities are. You know, what are the reasonable adjustments being made? What are schools doing in these situations? Now, this counting is not just about funding and where funding is available. It's about practices. A teacher notices that there's a student with concentration issues. So they break down the learning and do it in smaller chunks to address that. This constitutes the adjustments referred to um, in the disability standards. But it's not always counted in the nationally consistent counting of data. <clears throat> and so we don't have the knowledge that that adjustment's being made. Just because it hasn't made it to the disability confirmation sheets, or whatever you call them in uh, Victoria, I'm not sure, I think that's the name in New South Wales, doesn't mean that it doesn't count. It's not one or two percent of kids in your school classes with disabilities. You know that. It's 15 or 20 percent. So mainstream teachers may say that they don't have students with disability in their classes. Given the percentage in the population, this probably means that they're not properly counting. And we all know that old but true business rule, what you don't count doesn't count. So this counting and recognition of disability and adjustments is really important. Quality teaching and learning experiences include that um, some students sit at the front. Some people do more visual work. Some are moved to a quieter class. As educational leaders, you need to encourage others to move away from the confirmation sheet mentality to the mentality that students have different needs, needs which may vary over time, and, and that um, you and your colleagues are there to teach all students with all these different needs. It requires a change of attitude. It takes the biscuit. A good teacher teaches every kid in their class. Good principals take the approach that you walk through our local school gate, we will provide you with quality learning experiences and we'll make the adjustments to do that. Yes, that requires resources and funding in some, if not many cases. But it also requires enhanced capabilities and collaborative and purposeful relationships. Good principals use data counting to start dialogue with teachers about what are good practices and how can we do it better than we are currently. Because disability needs to be seen as part of everyone's core business throughout the school system. We need to ensure that our society caters for everyone not just for people without disability, people who fit a particular mould. And if the education environment doesn't do that, then society never will, because the education environment is where we all learn. Because the education environment should be teaching kids with disabilities to thrive in the broader community 
<clears throat> and should be teaching the broader community to celebrate and benefit from its diversity through the inclusion of kids with disabilities. That's much of what this conference is all about, isn't it? Turning that knowledge, that awareness, into action in, in your schools. Because if we don't start changing this mindset in you as educational leaders, then we won't achieve the culture change that we need to include kids with disabilities right from the start. You know, I was recently described by the CEO of a large disability agency to someone else who told me about it later, not to me directly, as a grumpy old bugger. <laughs> now, that was after I'd spent some time with him explaining how his organisation would need to change as a result of reform in the disability sector. I think he was a little bit challenged by my advocacy and he probably wouldn't be the first one to be in that situation. But in criticising me, he was shooting the messenger. Because to quote, if I may, Lord Eddard in Game of Thrones, winter is coming with the icy chill of choice and control for people with disabilities through the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Except I don't see it as an icy chill. I see it as a wonderful opportunity. And it's coming to education. It's coming to a school near you or where you work. And it may have already arrived. Now, whilst the NDIS will meet broader needs for people with disabilities, it won't meet all of the needs. Society more broadly, including the education sector, will, um, will need to meet those needs as well. So will the transport sector. So will the building sector. So will local councils. Across the community, the broader needs of people with disabilities will need to be met. So I challenge people who say to me, oh, well, the NDIS will fix that. And I sort of say, will it? You know, it will provide um, support for people with disabilities and our families, but it won't change the community to be a more inclusive place. One of the challenges um, for all of you will be to ensure that there are not gaps between disability services and education services. And I'm afraid to say that the line is fuzzy and complex. And those of you who have experienced it can probably confirm that. Parents will want to bring speech therapists into your schools, paid for by the NDIS. Personal care needs may need to be met, met by staff who come in and who you do not know. Now, of course, students need these supports, but the management of them will be complex, and that will fall onto you as educational leaders. Significant change will occur as a result of the NDIS. And that's another reason why data counting is so important, so that the frequency and complexity of that change can be mapped and measured. And we should never underestimate the resistance to that sort of change, because those of you who are leading school environments will know very well that culture eats planning and policy for breakfast every time. So you can't just have great plans and great policies. You've got to have strong and inclusive culture. But again, if I can quote from the, uh, from the Vogan, Vogons, uh, given that I've already told you um, a, a Douglas Adams story, resistance to this is futile. This change is happening because governments cannot afford not to fund the NDIS. And that's what uh, previous New South Wales premiers and ministers have said. It's not a question of can we afford the NDIS, it's can we afford not to. And they know that the answer to that is no. And you will be at the coalface dealing with that change and that resistance and that new order of things. And it's a challenging place to be. My guide dog and I walked through the ticket barrier at Wynyard Station last week with clear instructions uh, for where I was to meet my friend. I'll meet you at the top of the escalator for the Carrington Street entrance of Wynyard, Gemma told me. It's on your left after you walk through the ticket barrier. Wynyard, <coughs> for those of you who know it in Sydney, has a large open concourse between the ticket barrier and the Wynyard ramp, which takes you up to George Street. And I wasn't sure that my dog and I could find the escalators without assistance. They're sort of off to the left 
at about a 45 degree angle, but there's a lot of um, poles and pillars and shops to get through to find them. My dog would want to go straight up the Wynyard ramp, as we had done hundreds of times before. Guide dogs, Labradors, are good at nothing if they're not good at routine. They're awesome at routine. So you can get the, them to do the same things over and over again. You change the formula and you've got a bit more of a problem. So I asked the ticket barrier, or the man at the ticket barrier, could you tell me please where the escalators for Carrington Street are? Where do you want to go? Replied the attendant. I want to go to the escalator up to Carrington Street, <laughs> I repeated. Yes, but where do you want to go? He said. I'm meeting someone at the Carrington Street entrance, I said, not really understanding why he needed to know this or kept asking me this question. I thought I'd been really clear. Oh, OK, he replied. Yep, we've got a lift that will take you to that level. Now, I'm sure this man was trying to help, but he, consciously or unconsciously, had made a decision for me that anyone else would make for themselves. He had decided that I and my guide dog couldn't use an escalator something that we do multiple times every day. He had excluded me from that process and he'd made negative assumptions about me. Now, despite my reference to the escalator twice, or maybe three times, he decided that I needed to use the lift. So his actions would result in me not arriving where I wanted to go, that is, the top of the escalator. Now, look, this is a very minor example. <clears throat> and it didn't change my day much. I just went off on my way, found someone else who showed me the escalator and I got to where I wanted to be. But let's play this out in the educational context. We know that we build resilient kids by letting them practice making their own decisions. As a parent, I used to be really concerned when my wife had our daughter choose the clothes that she wanted to wear from about the age of three. Now, if Rachel didn't choose a jumper, my wife might suggest that she could get cold. But she left the decision to Rachel. I used to, uh, I used to actually sneak the odd jumper into my bag sometimes because I was a bit ra worried that Rachel uh, would get cold. But she soon learned that it was, and I soon learned that it was better for her to make those long-term, those decisions long-term. And the same is true in education. You know, we don't limit, we build capacity. And that's what we need to do for kids with disabilities. Now, these sorts of limiting incidents, um, like the one I described at Wynyard, happen every day to those of us who have a disability. All of you here with a disability could tell us similar stories. And if you can't remember those stories, you know what, it's not because they didn't happen, it's because they happen so often you don't even notice. Elizabeth Hastings, the first disability discrimination commissioner, used to talk about people with disabilities swimming in a sea of discrimination, and she was quite right. People park in accessible parking bays, removing the, the only option for parents bringing kids with mobility disabilities to school. People leave obstructions on footpaths and in school corridors, which people who are blind or have low vision run into or which people who have mobility disabilities trip over or can't get past. People in assemblies or lectures don't use microphones um, when they're available and exclude people with hearing impairments. People, children and adults, stare at our difference, our skin condition, our wheelchair or how we look. People use words without pictures on signs and exclude some people with learning or intellectual disabilities. People use words, and I'm going to use these words which I really don't like, but they're words we need to remove from our vocabulary, like mental, insane, retard or spastic, or describe others as turning a blind eye to my problem or being deaf to my concern. Language which hurts us and sends a message that we are diminished because of our disability. These words and actions disempower us. They take away our decision making. They deal with our disability first and us second. And you know the old rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. 
That couldn't be more wrong. All the research shows how language hurts and does damage. But you know what? I don't blame individuals so much because they behave in the way that our society teaches them to behave. They demonstrate a ne negative limiting attitude towards people with disabilities. That, sadly, is the societal norm. And your obligation as educational leaders is to knock down that societal norm, that attitude barrier. Because until that occurs, people with disabilities will not be equals and will not be included in Australian society. So how do we do that? How do we knock down that barrier, that limiting attitude? Well, we don't do it with slick marketing campaigns. We've tried that again and again and it doesn't work. We don't do it by hiding people with disabilities away in segregated places. And let's, let's just talk about more about that here wh while I've flagged that. As I said earlier, I'm one of a rare group who's experienced both segregated and inclusive education. Although, as I said, my hair colour will tell you that it's some time ago. So let me share my perspective and the perspective of more and more Australians with you. I loved the passionate, committed staff that I had at my segregated school. I loved the excellent resources that were available at my segregated school. What I didn't like was the separation from all of my friends after school and during weekends. Whilst other kids could go out their front door or their back door and play with their friends in the street, in the backyard, in sport, or in the local community fate, I lived too far away from my friends. And I spent a pretty lonely existence, not shared by other kids growing up. As you know, <coughs> education is much more than about learning. It's about adapting to living in the community and interacting with other community members. So why would we remove that experience for kids with disabilities by segregating them at school? It's far more difficult for us to adapt to the broader community when we're young adults and we have no friends in that community with whom we have grown up than if we've grown up with our local friends and we know them so that when we leave school, we still see them at the coffee shop or at the pub and we can inter uh, interact with them. Segregation now is old thinking and it's recognised internationally in the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities and in the uh, general comments of the United Nations Expert Committee on the Rights of People with Disabilities. It's recognised across Europe and Canada and the US. You know, in Italy, there are no segregated schools and there haven't been since the 1960s or 70s. Kids with disabilities learn in the community into which they will grow up. And the research shows that kids with disabilities in the community achieve better educational outcomes than those in segregated settings. Learning in the community for kids with disabilities is a basic human right. Yet our politicians in Australia don't seem to recognise this. They continually fall back on the mantra of parent choice. And while Victoria has some good inclusion policies at high level, it keeps building segregated schools. But let's analyse that parent choice for a minute. Those of you who've tried to uh, enrol your child in a mainstream school know that as a general rule, it's very much guided choice. Most mainstream, no, many mainstream schools, and I know that there are excellent exceptions, both in Victoria and in other places, guide kids with disabilities into segregated schools with arguments like, oh, we don't have the resources, oh, our teachers aren't trained to support kids with disabilities, or kids with disabilities will be better off with other children like that. And you know what? I'm not that critical of those schools when they say it. I am to a certain extent, but they're just reflecting the view across the community. So parents make their decisions with not much, if any, independent advice, and because they want their child to be safe and they send them to segregated schools. 
And I'm a parent. I get that. I want my daughter to be safe. I was the one who packed the jumpers in the bag, right? Yet even that perceived safety has its risks. The recent Royal Commission on Sexual Abuse of Children recognised in its reports that children with disabilities in segregated settings are at higher risk of sexual abuse than children in inclusive settings. So is that safety really true? But our politicians forge ahead. Other politicians in other countries, such as Jody Carr, an ex-education minister in New Brunswick in Canada, put it bluntly when talking of, um, of government responsibility in this area, and he said, we know that segregation means harm, and the role of governments includes protecting children from harm. So I can't support segregated settings. And why do we encourage parents to determine educational policy and outcomes when we limit parental choice in so many other ways? Parents don't have choice about the age at which their children can start to drive. Parents don't have a choice about the age at which their children can buy cigarettes or alcohol. And as I said, I don't criticise parents or teachers who choose segregated settings because they are a microcosm of our broader community, amongst whom the vast majority make decisions about people with disabilities which are negative and limiting, just like the man in Wynyard Station. That's why days such as this week's International Down Syndrome Day are so important, because they challenge these negative and limiting attitudes. And I encourage you to check out the um, Australian video for this day, for Down Syndrome Day, showing some excellent examples of successful inclusion of kids with disabilities. So we need to change those attitudes because the best way for us to do inclusion is by changing those attitudes and modelling positive attitudes. We do it with collaborative and purposeful relationships in schools which lead to changed cultures. We do it by enhancing capabilities of both students and teachers. We do it by providing quality teaching and learning experiences. We change mindsets. We take the biscuit. We do equality and inclusion by actually doing it and by doing it well. And that's what you can talk about, about this, at this conference today. How things could be. What you can do as educational leaders to ensure that disability is just one of the differences to be celebrated in our diverse educational environment and that all students receive quality learning experiences and have their capabilities enhanced. So challenge that soft bigotry of low expectations and make the power and transformation of education available to all students, including students with disabilities. Thank you very much for the chance to speak with you today. So I'm really happy to take questions um, for the rest of uh, the time that we, that we have. But as I said to you, um, I don't respond to people putting up their hands. Uh, I'm very rude about that. So um, we've got a couple of uh, roving microphones. Uh, please feel free to, um, uh, to start speaking with your voices and uh, uh, ask me anything more that, that you think I might be able to assist you with to start off your conference. You must have some questions. You must have something that you disagree with that I said or um, something that you'd like to delve into more. I can't believe that no one has any questions. It's always hard finding the first one. Once you get the first one, the floodgates open sometimes. So who's going to start us off? Well, we could just have an early morning tea, I suppose. But I could do with another cup of coffee this morning. I went to a wedding yesterday afternoon. Here's a question. Excellent. In, in schools throughout Victoria, how would you say, what advice would you give or even to participants here in changing school culture? I find that perhaps it's a bit easier to change school culture and views in primary schools than in secondary. So what strategies would you recommend to us mm. to do that? 
Um, it's, as I said, one of the tricky things to do. And I think you're probably right. It is easier to change cultures in primary schools. Kids are younger. Um, uh, there seem to be less pressures in the, in the schools. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure. Maybe parents are more amenable to, to changing culture. I mean, I, I think the best way to change culture is to draw kids with disabilities into your schools and just demonstrate the diversity um, of um, uh, and the value that that brings to school communities. Uh, a bit the same way as um, encouraging uh, young girls and young women to, uh, to study subjects that um, perhaps have normally been the, the province of young boys and young men. You know, <clears throat> that's how we, we started to uh, change those sorts of cultures. We, we found um, kids and, and families who wanted to support their daughters to, um, uh, to be what they wanted to be. Uh, because uh, Liz Broderick, my colleague, the ex-sex discrimination commissioner, says you cannot be what you cannot see. So showing examples of kids with disabilities being included in schools is a really powerful culture. And that's why I mentioned, you know, the, um, the Down Syndrome, uh, National Down Syndrome video. There's an excellent um, video on YouTube of the uh, local um, high school in Townsville in Queensland. I'm trying to remember its name as I'm speaking, seeing if I can, uh, you know, fill out a few more words while the brain ticks over, but I don't think it's going to. But if you Google Townsville High School Inclusion, I think you'd find it. And it's a, an interesting conversation with the principal and the, um, the leader of the... They had an educational support unit there about four or five years ago. And when she went there, she wanted to take down the fences of that unit and to draw those kids into the mainstream school, and that's what they've now done. Um, <clears throat> and it's a very powerful example. But there are many other examples of schools. I'm sure I know there are some in Victoria because I've seen them, I've visited them. Um, so sharing that experience, uh, drawing on the learnings of teachers who've who've taught in those places, uh, that's how you change cultures. But it doesn't happen fast. It's something that you chip chip away at. Questions. Sure. I think you've probably answered it, Graham, in the sense that um, in we are a, a very small private school, and we have a couple of kids with um, disability in the primary school. And we go to the large <coughs> specialist schools and say to those guys, come help us. And they, they very kindly, or are about to anyway, come visit and, and share their observations and their expertise and skills. But the reality at the present time in our school is, is that the kids who are disabled in our primary school have far less resources than they uh, than is being offered at the specialist school. So yep. while they do help us with some skills, our resources are sorely lacking. Yep. And probably 10 years from now, maybe that will change just a little, but those kids are going to be already through yeah. much of their education. Yeah. And that's difficult to deal with. <laughs> uh, it's, it's very difficult to deal with, and it's incredibly sad, because we know that their educational outcomes uh, at the, um, not, at, not the kids at your school, but we know that the educational outcomes of the kids at um, segregated schools will be worse. All the research tells us that. It's no, no longer just sort of Graham Inner standing up here and saying that. The research is really clear. Um, but resourcing is a problem. And that's why I mentioned some of the things that I mentioned. And I was talking about the public system rather than a, a private school because I haven't done a review of private school situations. But in the public system, a quarter to a third of the budget for kids with disabilities is spent on assessments. How crazy is that? You know, that money could be in the classroom supporting kids with disabilities. Uh, and not only is it spent on assessments done by um, professionals who could be, again, in schools supporting kids with disabilities to be um, more broadly included, and I don't mean uh, teachers, I mean psychologists and all of those sorts of therapists and all those sorts of people. Um, so not only, um, sorry, I was going to say something else. Um, so it, it's spent on those people, but so it's, they're pulled out of the classroom to do these assessments. And the assessment process is an incredibly negative and disempowering process for families. 
because families are sort of encouraged by the system, not by individuals so much, but by the system, to reinforce all the negatives about their kids because that's the way you get the most funding. No, it just doesn't make sense. It just does not make sense. Hi. Um, so, you know, I think that's one of the things that we need to, to challenge. But in small private schools, um, you know, you're right, resourcing is a significant challenge. Um, and I suppose um, it's all about numbers. So we have to encourage um, kids uh, and families of kids with disabilities to seek to participate in uh, mainstream uh, settings and, and not keep building segregated ones. And that way those resources can then flow back to where they should be in the mainstream system. It's not an easy process. I don't suggest that it is. I mean, you wouldn't be here today to talk about it if it was. Hi, Graham. Um, mine's more of a comment than it is a question. Sure. I just wanted to share that uh, I'm in my fifth year of teaching this year and I've had students with disabilities in all of my years at school in, working in the inner north. I just wanted to share that it reminded me, you're talking about culture change. Mm. The other day, um, well, in my first year of teaching at Coburg Primary, actually, one of the pieces of information that the principal had shared with me was don't just email parents all parents with something negative about what's happened that day. And it really resonated with me because of my first year of teaching and thinking, oh, how tired I am. All I'm worried about is what's going wrong and yeah, I'm yeah. failing and this is the worst and why am I a teacher? But now in my fifth year, it has really resonated with me over the last five years. I um, emailed one of my students with disabilities, his mother, just to say, look, I, had, I just had to share this today, your son, um, is not often included by one of the students in my grade who's often quite nasty to anyone with any difference due to his own issues as well. Uh, I said, but, you know, this child has reached out and actually said, oh, the reason we're taking so long in one of our tasks today is because we were trying to include your son, well, Alex, we were trying to include Alex and it's his turn to make the decision so we're waiting for him to have his input. And the music teacher that they were with, hold, relayed that to me. I relayed that in an email and I just said, look, I had to let you know that he's being included not from external forces, not from the staff putting it onto this child, but just that was one thing that happened that week and then it happened again later in the week and they were congratulating Alex on, you know, the reason we won at soccer today was because you, you defended the goal so well and all this positive chat. The mother came and spoke to me and emailed me back and said she cried. Yep because when her son, who's now in grade three in my class, when he was in prep, a grandfather that to this day she still doesn't know, um, came up to her and said, you've just done this school a wealth of good by bringing your child here. It's gonna be good for the children and for him. And she goes, I was so angry for the last four years thinking about that. She goes, but now your comments and that relay of that positive thing has happened. Mm. She goes, I now understand what he meant. And it was so lovely to be a part of that. And yeah. I just thought all that took was for me to say one, you know, one bit of positive yeah, comment to back to her. Yeah, celebrate that, yep. mm. um, Look, thanks for making that, telling that story and making that point, because it's a really important point, and I hope I made it today, but uh, it can't be made enough, and that is the importance of celebrating positives and celebrating success. Uh, and that's how um, good schools achieve uh, inclusion. That's how, you know, good sporting teams become better sporting teams. Uh, that's how businesses become better businesses because they they celebrate achievement and they celebrate success and they recognise uh, contributions across the across the board. Um, my wife has an online business that um, has a you know a, a chat system within the staff of the business, and, uh, and one of the things um, that happens is that if you do something good, you get awarded a virtual taco. Now, <laughs> doesn't sound much. But you know what the talk in the office is all about? Is, oh, so-and-so got a taco for it. Isn't that fantastic, you know? And it's that celebration of positives. And just little things like that can mean so much. Um, and uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the case of, uh, you may know of this case, Finney versus the Hills Grammar School, where a young girl with spina bifida was excluded from a school in uh, New South Wales. And one of the areas of finding um, in that case was that... <clears throat> not just the benefits that she would get from attending the school, but the benefits the broader community would gain from having a person with a disability uh, there at the school. That school has turned right round and it's now a very inclusive school. Um, and you can see the uh, story of that on uh, 
there's a set of videos called 20 Years, 20 Stories on the Human Rights Commission uh, website and, uh, uh, and the Finney um, case is one of those stories. So really important point. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Graham. Um, as educators, I suppose we know that parents can sometimes struggle um, when they have children that have um, special needs or additional needs. Um, and when they send them to mainstream schooling, um, they can often struggle to understand why their child is not the same as their peers. Um, so my question to you is how do you, I guess, um, speak to the parents and help them understand their child's needs um, and help them to understand as a school how you can best support them um, I've got a child in my class with Down syndrome. Their, his parents acknowledge that he has Down syndrome, um, but hasn't yet made the child aware. He's now 12 years old in year four, um, and the child knows that he isn't the same as his peers, but there's nothing really done at home to support that. So mm. there's no consistency <coughs> between home life and school life, and it's now at 12 years old, he's, you know, hitting puberty and yep. the next stage of his life and it's yep. becoming a lot more difficult yep. to support him without that home support as well. I, I think, um, I mean, one thing I would say, and there are, there are education, educators in this room who would uh, be able to answer this far better than me. I mean, that was my point at the start of my presentation. Um, I mean, the first thing I'd say is that at 12 years old, he knows he's different. He might not know, you know, the, the exact nature of it or whatever, but he knows he's different. Um, I certainly, as a child who was blind, uh, I mean, I worked it out when I started running into things and the other kids didn't. And that sounds a bit sort of funny, but it, it, it's sort of the way it was. So my parents didn't make a big thing about my, my disability. They were very supportive, but it wasn't, wasn't a big sort of topic of discussion. Um, I think um, celebrating, uh, well, firstly, working with families to have an individual education plan so that the, the goals and the um, outcomes or achievements for uh, this particular student are, are there at the beginning of the year or whenever you do your IEPs and, and ticking those things off at the end of the day and the end of the week and looking at the achievements which have been uh, made uh, in you know, a, whatever you have, a school diary or a school journal or in some way um, you know, communicating that sort of thing with parents because those communications will get shared at home amongst the parents and they'll be talked about and you know, the kids will inevitably hear about that. So I guess that's one thing I would suggest, but I'm sure there are other, other ways of doing it too, and that's part of what today is about, to have conversations about those things, I guess. Hi, Graeme. My name's Kate. I'm a Hi, Kate. teacher in a secondary school, and I'm new to the whole PSD game, and I'm loving it, but I'm finding one of my biggest challenges is the application process for funding and feel like it about you have expressed um, your feeling and putting parents and kids through that whole process. Oh. And another bugbear particularly is the 6-7 review where <laughs> primary schools who are sending their children off to secondary, they're the ones responsible for putting that final funding in and yeah. the secondary school gets his kid without knowing anything about them. Yeah. So I'd really like to understand how we can change the culture of the funding for PSD children so that number one, it can be secondary schools who get to check kids out in year seven and then say this is what we need in place to support our kids for the rest of their yep. secondary schooling. Yep. But also how do we make the process less arduous for teachers who are yep. so busy anyway to try and apply for this funding yep. and then to make it less traumatic for the children and their families to have all these support services come in and make them jump through these hoops to get it. Sure. Um, I mean, I think that um, there is change on the way in this area and I don't know the nature in any detail of that change but I, I do understand that there is change on the way um, because the current system is so uh, um, expensive and has such a negative impact because of the way I explained it that, you know, it, it, it gets parents to sell their child as negatively as, uh, as possible uh, and then you have to turn that around for, for the learning outcomes. It just makes no sense. Um, so um, I guess as a teacher, um, expressing that view, you know, through through your school leaders and to the department, so that departments the department is hearing that there are teachers in schools who would like change. Um, I can't suggest more than that, uh, unless of course you know, writing to politicians or the the minister for education expressing that view. I think there is movement in this area. Certainly, the PSD review recommended significant change in this area. Um, in broad terms along the lines that I've talked about. 
uh, and and I understand that there is work being done, but I don't know the details. Hello, Graham. My name's Janet. I just had a question about, um, and maybe just your thoughts on uh, the funding for children with disabilities in the sports arena. Um, you know, we are, at my school have seen one child go through and have great opportunity in sport. Um, and I, he did pursue an academic career as well. But do you have any comments on funding to sport? Um, well, it's important, as I said, to if, for kids to be included across the whole spectrum of school activities, so not just in the classroom, um, but in, in school activities, school camps, school sport, whatever. Um, sometimes, depending on the nature of the disability and the you know, available um, uh, facilities and support, sport can be uh, one of the tricky ones. Um, and, uh, and, and maybe, um, you know, reaching out to some of the uh, uh, Paralympic or um, other uh, organisations conducting sport for kids with disabilities. Um, sport can often be a <coughs> an area in which kids with disabilities um, can achieve and, and that can boost confidence for, um, you know, academic uh, activities. So uh, there can be some real advantages. Uh, and sometimes... Um, kids with disabilities can be included in sport activities. There's a, a myriad of, of good ways to do it. And more, more and more mainstream sports are, um, are arranging and supportive of um, including kids with disabilities um, in activities. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not across the board yet, but it is, uh, it is happening and I think it can be a real positive um, if used uh, effectively. I'm sorry, I don't think I've answered your question very well, but I'm sure there are many other people in the room who will tell you examples of how it's happening in their, in their schools, because I know it is far more than it used to. Um, can I just say, um, I hope the rest of your conference goes uh, uh, really positively. I hope that I've um, made a, a, a contribution to, to starting it off uh, as a non-expert. And, uh, and congratulations to all of you who are including uh, kids with disabilities, because it can sometimes be a difficult thing to do but you're giving kids with disabilities such a fantastic start in life and it, it will make a huge difference in 10, 20, 30, 40 years' time. So thank you very much. Thank you.